then on the name of gold they created empires and empires they failed on the name of glory on ideology they fought and fought they failed he said very very interestingly in all these three phases of human evolution and history there was a fourth g called gender and uh, women were either bystanders or cheerleaders misleadingly in the whole thing and probably he said the fourth g could be the answer in future for the world to be uh, productive peaceful or it has to sustain itself for whatever creation creator did so this is a very very macro perspective from that macro perspective i think i read this about 25 years back or maybe 27 it was very deeply i was thinking about it but if i really look at 25 years is there an incremental thing sometimes there is incrementalism which people may call tokenism but in the real sense is it uh, incremental some will argue there is some increment but some will say that that increment is nothing these increments are also a kind of uh, adjustment of guilt feeling or whatever is that they try to do ritualistically is what they say so the reason being very deep deep rooted i would say that uh, bias in different walks and different things which uh, very interestingly when the organizers gave me the presentability of the world bank world Star, world united nations study which even says 80 percent women think you know women should be correct place they are in so that is that is the most uh, what, I, what i call a scary thing more than men thinking men are uh, maybe scared they are talking like that but i don't know women why they have to believe that and then do that that becomes a very very important part so uh, so in that context why i said was i was telling um, when the program organizers i was talking to anita and then i said coordinator should be these women women then she said sir this is very cliche that everything has to be women in this program then uh, i only remember i think uh, professor vidya will uh, you know recollect ginsburg the second chief justice when she was asked how many people you want women in supreme court she said all the nine they said isn't it crazy she said that you never asked this when there were nine men and you're asking me when i say nine women so in that sense i want to tell but i think you know uh, probably i'm the uh, only side of the other gender you know uh, in a minority now representing in this program talking to you so i don't want to take much time i thought i will uh, invite our guests and uh, I think you're going to do the formal introduction. But uh, as I said, that uh, uh, Professor Raghavan uh, was, uh, you know, a French branch student once upon a time in my class. And you can understand French branch student means who are very obedient, who are very silent, who will listen to everything what the teacher says. But I never thought she will be so vocal at a later stage in life, right? And uh, I have tried to argue and I have lost my case many times with her. So she is now a professor of standing on uh, in, in, uh, intellectual property and other areas in Texas, a and and uh, I would call it, uh, is, uh, if, it won't be very appropriate if she say, say it's an Indophile. She's actually an Indian who loves all Indian stuff. But, you know, she, what you call as bats and votes for India in many, many forums in U.S. and helps Indian students to come and do. It was a great pleasure, as I said, but I'm waking her up in a very early cold morning. But she agreed. She said, sir, I will come. And she has been a... Uh, what I call this once upon a student and then a colleague, a friend, and uh, I'm pretty sure are standing now. She will be my guide in many things of the subject and other things. So I welcome her on my behalf. And uh, uh, Ms. Kaumudi Goda, as I said, uh, 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 Honorable Justice Raghuram Goda is, I know him for the last 10 years. And our relationship is mostly not talking about law, talking about other things, right? We, it, it meanders into philosophy. It meanders into metaphysics. You know, this is the type we both like to talk each other more than in a law per se. Often he does give me some good tips about handling few things. And so he has been on and off. Uh, we used to talk and of recent times I visit him quite often being in Hyderabad. And in, in that context, he was telling about he, he went to recently to stay with his daughter and came back. And then at that context, when he was telling him that, you know, she would like to, uh, you know, spend an interact and it's a good idea. So. Ms. Komodi Goda from Singapore, she is with us. And uh, we are not slotting anyone, but one is from law, one is from management. Then we tried for arts and culture. We tried to get a singer from Chhattisgarh, but she was uh, 
very, as you said, uh, tied up being an uh, international day today. And then we are also in touch with uh, one of the sports luminary from Chhattisgarh. Hopefully, she will be joining. There are a few glitches in getting into the web. I think my organizer will be say. With this, I think, you know, um, uh, whatever uh, limited sensitivity I understood about gender, I did talk to you because uh, my mother is the only lady. We are four brothers and my father, you know, five of us. You can understand what type of, you know, gender equation we had when we grew up. And interestingly, my wife, there are three daughters and uh, 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 her mother and only her father. It was a totally opposite you know, kind of thing and probably we met and there is some level of gender equity which has come now in my life also. So with that, I thought uh, this is a session, as you said, even though we are marking on March 8th as International Women's Day, right? It is basically, we thought we'll keep it open-ended and we said uh, rewriting her story because it has been his story always. So we thought we'll title this as rewriting her story. Basically, people talking about, you know, their own level, what they did, how they came. And uh, as you said that, this is not just at one level. Uh, it is, I always sometimes felt at the lower strata, there is more equality. You know, I lived in North Madras, which is a very, very tough area. I know that there was more. More I find it when you move up the ladder, it is so subtle. And, you know, you, you really find many things if you move up more than it is going in the, what I call a, in a different strata, subaltern level, it is much more equal much more people are tough in terms of demanding or you know getting the respect over and over above it goes it gets into a very sophisticated nuance where there you know what you call us we appreciate you we adore you but you know you be there right that's kind of stuff so in that context all three of them in different uh, levels of walks of life and doing i think they'll be able to talk to you and make this as one of the inspiring evening so that uh, you know all of us contemplate back and do our bit thank you Thank you so much, sir. We now begin with our session. We have with us Ms. Komudi Gora. Um, Ma'am is an award-winning public speaker, executive coach, consultant, trainer, and facilitator. Before embarking on her career in human capital, Ma'am practiced, uh, practiced as an attorney at law in the United States with an LLM from University of Virginia. She has an MBA from Indian School of Business and is currently licensed to practice law in India and the US. Ma'am was recognized as Business APAC Influential Women Leader of 2020 and has been featured in Financial Times London, Asian Entrepreneur, Times of India and The Hindu. May I now request Ma'am to kindly share her story. Over to you Ma'am. Thank you Professor Garima. Professors Vivekanandan, Srivastava, Garima Ankita, as well as Professor Srividya and fellow speaker and pro athlete Sabah, all the students and members of the HNLU ecosystem and those who are joining us via the live streaming. A very warm welcome and thank you so much for making the time to listen to our conversations today. Before I begin, I'd like to invite all of you to set aside any of preconceived notions or assumptions you have. Let us create a safe space for an honest and courageous conversation. Some of these topics are very sensitive I can almost feel like a landmine. In today's cancel culture and social media explosive controversies, people often shudder in horror at the idea of taking a misstep, asking a dumb question, or making a thoughtless remark, and being promptly canceled for doing that. So let us not worry about such things today. And for the remainder of the session, listen to each other to understand and truly share the thoughts that bubble up for us. If we create safe spaces where people can honestly ask the questions, get the information and listen to each other, immediately, right in this little corner of the world, you're going to make a more inclusive space. Do I have your agreement on this? Give me a thumbs up. If you say, yay, all right, thank you very much. So I work in a lot of different fields, as you've seen, and a part of that evolution professionally has been an outcome of me wanting to work in greater alignment with my values. I was a classic Indian kid living under a very big shadow. 
I had a dad I admired and I wanted to follow into the profession, but I was a timid child with a shaky voice who cried the drop of a hat. So people said, hey, G, how on earth are you going to be a lawyer? You can barely talk without bursting into tears. And when I went into law school, no matter how hard I worked, that huge shadow loomed over me. Am I ever going to be good enough? Or am I going to be the khandan ki nakat wane wali ladki? So I ran away from India all the way to the US to try and carve out my own little place in the world. And I went from a timid girl who said things like, may please the honorable court, to big bad New York City, fresh off the boat with a thick Indian accent. As you can imagine, it was a huge cultural adjustment, learning how to talk more directly and assertively. So eight years back when I moved, I had spent the bulk of my profession being studiously neutral, professional to the point of pain, and ensuring that no one could ever accuse me of being a girly girl who was timid. And when I moved to Singapore, having worked for 10 years in New York City as an attorney, some of the questions that I encountered when I was interviewing, like, hmm, you just had babies. Will you be able to concentrate on work? Or would you like to work in Indian companies because you're an Indian person, as if the last 10 years of my professional experience counted for nothing, made me realize I needed to step up and do something because certainly things hadn't changed in the last 10 years. What came to my mind was what Martin Luther King said. Martin Luther King Jr., of course, is a world famous leader. And what he said was it was not the actions of the bad people, but the inactions of good people that hurt the most. I've been battling against biased assumptions, boxes and labels that we're all trapped in my entire life. And I even low key, without anybody's notice, worked in gender empowerment my entire career. I always had my job, and then I had my passion, which was women empowerment. But I felt I needed to hide it like a guilty, shameful secret, lest I be branded as a femi Nazi who was just brandishing a broom and painting all the men in the vicinity as a villain. I said, you know what? I'm going to take a stand. I want to work in this field. I want to help build more inclusive workplaces and develop inclusive leaders. And that's how today I'm a consultant who works on leadership development. I coach executives and I am a vocal and passionate advocate for inclusion and sustainable development of people. What I want to share with you is a little case study. Bear with me and let me know if you see my slides. Are you able to see my slide? Yes, ma'am. Great. I want you to meet this team. Now I've changed the name and some of the details, but the story is mostly authentic. Today, I coach a lot of different boards. And this particular board worked for a very progressive organization. And all the individuals you see on the screen are highly educated with at least a master's degree and several years of experience in their belt. Please meet Jeremy. Cecile, James, and Jonathan. Ivy was a staff member who worked under them. So she reported to all of them. Now, Jeremy was an old school professional. He'd have no compunctions calling Ivy at 11 p.m. the night and yelling at her for not doing something on time, forgetting oftentimes to invite Ivy to meetings because he simply didn't consider her important enough. After all, she was reporting to him, and just a secretary. But Irie had been serving in this organization for nearly a decade longer than Jeremy. And while the power dynamic in terms of hierarchy was indeed in the favor of Jeremy, Irie was far more experienced and had wisdom that she attained from years and years of working in this field and in particular this organization. She'd seen many professionals like Jeremy come and go. Working along with Jeremy was Cecile. So when Irie felt exhausted from constant aggression from Jeremy, she approached Cecile. Cecile said, I've never seen Jeremy be rude to me. Must be your mistake, Irie. 
please give him another chance. I don't think Jeremy is that kind of a person. Irie continued to suffer. So she approached James. James was a thorough gentleman and such a nice person. James said, Irie, I think Jeremy is a little bit rude to almost every human being. I don't think it's gender based. I must admit, I never get left out of meetings by Jeremy. Why don't you give him a moment of grace? Assume positive intent from Jeremy. And you know what? You're a woman. Your job and your salary comes from this job. Maybe just keep quiet and bear this out. Jeremy will soon get transferred and you'll get another boss, right? Just put up with it. The last member on the team was Jonathan. Jonathan could observe many times how Irie was dismissed, interrupted, ignored, and left out of important emails and meetings, making her job extremely hard. So Jonathan brought this up. Of course, Jeremy felt an identity threat. Jeremy said, I am a very good person. I'm a very good leader. How dare you accuse me of gender harassment? I absolutely refuse. And the statement that jumped out at me in all of these conversations was this. Jeremy said, all of these privileged women, literally, they're the top dog in the world right now. One word from them and careers are finished. How dare they misuse this privilege and bring up some issues? If she worked hard and did a good job, I'd have no cause to scold her. And she isn't important on some of the meetings that I leave her out of. What's the problem? Well, here's the problem. The problem is that oftentimes, let me stop the sharing so I can speak with you again. The problem is that oftentimes people assume that if it is something like the monster Harvey Weinstein's actions, where they harass women to the extent of sexual assault, and that's a clear crime. And then, of course, action will be taken. But many of these tiny, tiny micro aggressions are like paper cuts, simple little things like being dismissed, disregarded, invalidated, disrespected spoken over, left out despite their expertise and qualifications, oftentimes fester like raw wounds. When people feel disengaged from the workplaces, don't feel seen, heard, understood and appreciated, they leave. If Irie left, the organization would collapse because she's the custodian of so much knowledge from her tenure. None of the people changed their minds when I attempted to mediate their conversations. I will come back to this story a little later. But I wanted to ask you if you have had the opportunity to see this slide. As I was saying, some of the obvious things like assault, discrimination, that as, such as being fired for being pregnant or being ignored during promotions purely for the recorded reason of being female, those are easily actionable. As a matter of fact, they are crimes in most organizations and most self-respecting, sane and rational professionals won't indulge in such behavior. Such egregious conduct is not what I want you to pay attention to today. What I want you to pay attention to is a lower part of the iceberg you're seeing today. That's the invisible stuff. Those are the microaggressions I just referred to. Those are the gender double bind. If a woman who is a professional is soft-spoken and friendly, she's seen as mousy and not leadership material. And when she is assertive and speaks clearly and insists on getting work done, she's seen as bossy and off-putting. And do we really want such an aggressive person in our team? The same criticism isn't seen and extended towards men because Assertiveness is seen correctly as assertiveness in men, but misperceived as unnecessary bossiness from women. Another one is stereotypes. Women also have the cultural thumbprint. This is Nobel Award Prize winning research. We all have absorbed like sponges, fairy tales from our childhood, the way our older generation of women were treated, the way we have grown up watching the media. 
and absorbed all these stereotypes, we also feel uncomfortable bucking those trends. We feel unsafe speaking up. Many women are absolutely ingrained into the idea of being nice. No matter what happens, be polite and get along because that behavior is always rewarded. Similarly, men are rewarded for taking risks and being bold. So you see, these cultural thumbprints also show up in our brains. So whether a man is biased towards me or not, I'm likely biased towards myself too because I hold those stereotypes deep in my subconscious where I'm not aware. Another one we'll see is subsumed stereotypes. Many Gen Z students will absolutely be aghast at the idea that they are not supportive of inclusion. And yet they're only mirroring behaviors that they saw in their previous generation and don't realize it. And finally, the most egregious one is benevolent sexism. You've seen it. My dear, you've just had a child. Are you sure you want this project? It's very, very hard. You take rest and I'll give it to your male colleague who's single and can do it. That's benevolence. They mean well, but the impact is that it holds women back from opportunities. There's a lot more that we can discuss here and I'm most, most uh, welcome to engage me in this conversation later. But how many of you have seen this very famous cartoon that Mr. Mahindra popularized and made viral in India as well? Have you all seen this? Give me a thumbs up if you've seen this cartoon on your WhatsApp forwards, on your social media. Now you can see this is a step. It makes people smile because we all resonate with it. I was once working at a big four accounting firm and the partner at 11.30 of a busy season when we had really, really important targets to finish, said, KG, I have to nip home and come back. I said, why? She said, Christmas isn't going to happen if I don't go home, bake a batch of cookies and wrap my children's presents. She was a partner at a big four, a career to die for. And she still felt pressure in the middle of a busy season because Christmas won't happen if women don't do it. So women not only face the burden, unpaid labor, such as care work for the elderly and children, we all experience this during COVID. They also have these expectations at work too. Think to your workplaces. The women are the ones organizing festivities, remembering birthdays, taking notes, organizing food for your meetings. Take turns there because this is unpaid labor. In fact, the International Labor of, uh, Organization said that women face up to 2.5 times more unpaid labor than men in both developing and developed countries. We all know that in places where there is gender diversity and inclusion, there's a compelling business case, there's scads and scads of research. But for the record, let me remind you that in places where we have diversity of thought, abilities, values, working styles, personalities, and skills, they're twice as likely to exceed financial targets. Such organizations are three times more likely to be high performing six times more likely to be innovative and agile, and eight times to have better business outcomes. We all know that there's a compelling business case, there's a compelling ethical case, and there's a compelling emotional case to treat each other with respect and kindness, and yet we don't do it because our minds have absorbed all of these values, and we have a gap between our aspired values or espoused values where I'm an inclusive person, how dare you, said Jeremy, how dare you accuse me of being sexist, but everyday actions fall short. And it is this gap of knowing and respecting these inclusive values and everyday behavior that we need to bridge. Does it mean men are ruling the roost? No, they're not. All of us have grown up with these stereotypes. Men don't cry, man up. Stop being such a girl. Be a man. Don't be a wimp. Gender stereotypes hurt not just women, but men too. How many men executives have told me they suffered because they were expected to mask and suppress their emotions, always have an appearance of hardness, and use violence in words and in actions as an indicator of power. Not long back, I was advising an executive of a FMCG company and he said, KG, 
no matter what happens, even if I'm having anxiety attacks on the regular, I can never confess either to my wife and children, nor to my team that COVID has really caused me a lot of anxiety. I dare not show any weakness because everyone's stressed out and they're depending on me to be the strong one. And if I don't make this promotion, then I will have failed not just my team, but also as a man to my family. Who can live with that pressure? All of us deserve to live our authentic lives with honest emotions without all of these boxes and labels. So coming back to our team, Jonathan, James, Jeremy and Cecil, what I did was I advised them to take an inclusion workshop where they can work on some of their implicit associations in their brains and learn how to be a more collaborative team free of such expectations. It remains to be seen if it works. But here's what I want to leave you with. We don't need to be perfect, but we do need to try and be better every day. As Maya Angelou said, do your very best till you know better. And when you know better, try to do better. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Your words were so relatable, especially the urge to get out of that curly, curly way. Just inform the August gathering that Sava Ma'am has also joined us for the session. Let's proceed with the next segment. For our segment on women in law, we are privileged to have with us Professor Dr. Srividya Raghavan Ma'am. Ma'am is a professor of law and director of India programs at School of Law, Texas A&M University. Her research area is related to issues relating to international trade and intellectual property rights. She writes on varied uh, issues related to traditional knowledge, pharmaceutical patenting, and agricultural subsidies. She has served as a Fulbright Nehru scholar and as a Fulbright specialist in South Asia region. May I now request ma'am to address the gathering. Thank you, Ms. Power. Uh, am I being heard? Can, I, can you hear me? Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be speaking in this uh, in this gathering on such a wonderful day. Uh, so I want to take from Ms. Goda and say that I too was born and raised in Gobi Chetti Palyam, right? So it's uh, my upbringing was very different from where I am today, but I do believe that my upbringing, uh, you know, gave me that's the foundation from which all of us, uh, you know, become who we are. Uh, and Professor Vivekanandan too is absolutely right when he says, uh, when I first went to national law school, uh, not only was I a front bencher, I remember I would call my parents every day and then say, oh my God, this is, this is so difficult. I, you know, it, it was such a diverse background that it took me some time to uh, acclimatize myself to the, to that entire uh, scenario, right? And then, of course, I went to England. I did my master's in England uh, and backpacked across Europe, both of which I think was very instrumental in, in making me who I am today, right? Because that whole experience of seeing people from different parts of the world helped me understand that at the end of the day, everybody's human, right? And we all come with the same set of packages of biases and issues and you know, and, and predilections and preconceived notions that end up defining us as we grow up. Uh, and then I moved to the US after coming back to India. I worked in India, uh, both in a big law firm as well as in uh, uh, big companies, and then came back to the US, did my SJD in George Washington University, and then went to Oklahoma. Uh, my standing joke, I was recruited as a professor in Oklahoma, um, my standing joke, which I say even today, is I came from a third world and ended up in the fourth world, right? Oklahoma, living there, being there was an eye opener in itself, right? Oklahoma is a very, very conservative state, conservative in more ways than one. Uh, and uh, I really learned much from, uh, from my experiences in Oklahoma. So what I, and of course now I'm in Texas A&M University, Texas A&M being the biggest university in the United States in terms of the number of students enrolled uh, in the US. Despite that, I find that uh, Texas A&M uh, too, I mean, people are people anywhere you go, right? And it comes with its own packages of predilections and 
preconceived notions. Uh, so what I want to talk about today is uh, to highlight some of the biases that I have encountered, uh, you know, in my career. Uh, and I want to talk about how these biases shape us. Uh, we can learn from it and grow out of it. Uh, but these biases are important to identify as we grow, as we uh, encounter it in our everyday life. Um, and uh, so one of the biggest biases, I, I, you know, I speak in India, I speak in the US, I, uh, I go to Europe often enough, but these are the two big jurisdictions in which, uh, you know, I, I, I move around. Uh, one of the biggest biases that I encounter in India is that, is that women are free abroad. That's one of the biggest, I mean, when I talk to a woman, young lady in, in India, they always say, oh, ma'am, you live in U.S., it must be so free, you could do this. No, you cannot. Women don't get paid the same level, at the same level as men, even in the U.S. You really have to be assertive in the U.S. to get that. Women in the U.S. and, and in Europe, too, I've spent enough time in Europe to say this confidently, right, are, are sexualized. Right? So from that perspective, right? Yes, you could grow a little bit, but when that aspect of it, that women are sexualized, absolutely is one reason why they're also pushed down. So you will see them grow up into a middle level sort of a job, but beyond that, you won't see uh, women growing up, uh, women being pushed up beyond that. Right. Um, several years back, when Jaya Lalita passed away, I wrote in the Hindu business line comparing Jaya Lalita with Hillary Clinton. Right. Hillary Clinton comes with the most credentialed background, the most privileged background as the first lady of the former first lady, rather, of the United States. Uh, great education. She has done enough policy work in healthcare uh, in the healthcare spectrum. Uh, that would that would command respect anywhere else in the world, but to get the kind of power and respect that Jaya Lalita enjoyed in uh, in Tamil Nadu, Hillary Clinton would beg for it. Honestly, right? She was she was literally demonized when she tried to, uh, you know, when she was a candidate in the election, right? So in a lot of ways, I'm not saying that India is the you know is the greatest, but in a lot of ways. Feminism and the idea of equality is not yet there in, in, in the entire world, right? There is some freedom in the West. I mean, you can wear little skirts, you could wear less clothes, nobody cares. Those kind of freedoms are there. But freedom in areas where it matters, I actually think there is more opportunities for that in, in India. You see women having power, having a lot of power, having the type of respect they, 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 they have within their families and circles. A lot of women IAs officers, all of that is still much more in, in India. That doesn't mean in India we always treat women well too. I al also see that in India, that you're a woman, we, we try to make them gods and goddesses and use that as an excuse to put uh, women down. So it's always a balance. It's up to us to be able to understand it and then be aggressive and, and uh, you know, uh, and work uh, accordingly. The other big uh, thing that I see both in the US as well as here is that feminism means wanting to do everything that a man does. In my experience, right, that's not the right way to do it. That puts man in the pedestal. Honestly, I don't want to do everything a man does, right? When I go to the airport, I would rather a man pick up my luggage and put that in the car. I would rather a man drives my car, right? So I don't want to do everything that a man does. I mean, that's me. Some, some women may, may want to do it. But feminism, in my definition, is doing everything that I want to do, right? In the way that I want to do. And the most important aspect of being a feminist, in my definition, is being able to not do what I don't want to do. Being able to tell my boss, look, I'm going to give that lecture in HNLU, but I'm not going to give that lecture at whatever school you ask me to do tomorrow. 
right? So that's feminism, being able to do what I want to do and not doing what I don't want to do. Along the same lines, I also see that in India, a lot of times, right? I see girls and women saying, I want to be considered equal to a man, right? That concept of equality. I don't want to be compared with a man. Man is not my yardstick. I want to be better or worse. I don't care to be compared with a man, right? Man is never my yardstick because when you put a man as the e equality yardstick, you abide by standards they set, right? That happens more so with immigrants. I see that in the US, right? So we come here as Indian immigrants over a period of time. A lot of times we want to do what the Americans do because Americans do it, not because it's the good thing or it's the right thing, right? And over a period of time, you realize that, yes, there are some things that, you know, you have to do because they do it and it's the right thing to do. But there are some things that we do and that's the right thing to do, right? So there is no need to be equal in that sense. There, what we need is a space carved for ourselves as individuals, as women, as, as an independent woman, right? Uh, and so that's a very sort of important aspect that I see in India that, that I always find uh, interesting, right? That, that this concept of uh, equality, right? The next thing I want to say is in a lot of ways, and this is more sort of global, that we try as women to have career paths that are set for us to follow. Be a doctor, be a lawyer, be an engineer, do your MBA right need not be as a woman we should be able to carve our own paths i was so pleased to see miss saba kareem right it takes a lot of courage to walk a path that is untread and give it a shot it is so powerful to be able to see that right my own daughter is a tennis player right and so uh, she comes from a family of geeks to be clear but she wants to play tennis. She wants to play tennis in college. She wants to, uh, you know, follow a path in that area. And as a parent, I see how difficult it is, especially for women, right? Because we come with a package of inbuilt uh, physical or uh, emotional challenges. Not that men don't have it. Men come with their own packages of physical and emotional challenges, right? But the biggest thing that we have to remember, right, is that as women, we don't have to follow a set path that somebody has put for us. Be a mom, be a wife, be a this, be a that. No, I want to be myself, right? That's an important aspect, right? The world is not, it's not a set of binary standards. It, it's not a set of what a man does and what a woman does. There is no need to look at the world from a binary lens, right? So having talked about uh, some of these uh, biases, the, the one other big bias that I see, uh, sorry, and I, I wanted to highlight this as well, is that feminists don't have family values. I see that repeatedly, right? People tell me, oh, you're very career oriented. Ma'am, do you have children? And I want to tell them none of your business, whether I have children or whether I have a husband, right? I mean, honestly, why do you care? I mean, are you going to are you going to give me your kids if I say I don't have kids? I have kids, but that's none of anybody's business, right? You ask me nicely, well, I have two kids. Do you have kids? Or that's a different thing. But that inherent bias, right? That, oh, you're very career oriented. This means you are this, right? And I usually say, when you're very biased, this means you're not open-minded, right? So keep that in mind. If, you know, we don't have to, uh, those biases need to go, right? That if you're a career-oriented woman, it means something. If you're not career-oriented, it means something. And that same thing goes to a housewife too. I have seen my mother, other parents, who work just as hard as I do in the house. They take care of, and especially here in the US, I see women 
who run the entire family, but they don't have a job, right? It doesn't mean they are any less of a woman. It doesn't mean they are any less capable, right? So it's something that we all of us have to uh, have to appreciate. And these are biases as women we have to understand and, uh, you know, as, as we move forward in our lives. But repeatedly with the Indian women, because this is an Indian audience, right? I see two things that happen that I wanted to call out today as I get the opportunity, right? Uh, so one is, this does not happen with all women, I think particularly with uh, Indian women, right? So for example, if in an office, right? So I go to say Jack, and then I go to ask Jack, Jack, did you finish that work yesterday? And Jack would reply, no, I couldn't do it, right? Sorry but I'll finish it today, worst case by tomorrow, right? I go ask, uh, I don't know, Jane, and Jane would say, oh, you know, I was really busy yesterday, I couldn't finish it, I'll finish it today. I go ask Lakshmi, an Indian woman, oh, I did not finish it because yesterday my daughter was sick and I had to go in the rain and I had to drive. You know, I'm not such a good driver, da 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 da, -da. And I wanna tell Lakshmi, I don't care why you didn't do it. Don't tell me. I don't need to know your driving skills are poor. I don't need to know because by saying these things, maybe Jack was partying and didn't finish it. But because you're giving me an excuse, you're giving me an opportunity to tell you, oh, why didn't you put your child to sleep and still sit in your computer and finish it, right? Don't give yourself, don't be defensive. If you didn't do it, you didn't do it, do it in time, apologize adequately and move on. I see that with some Indian men too, but it's an Indian women phenomena in the West, right? We are defensive to, I mean, to, until the boss says, it's okay, leave it alone, just finish the damn thing, right? So we'll continue to be defensive until that happens. The other thing is what I call as, the inability to be a jack in the box. And this is my last point, right? So this is the inability to be a jack in the box. What's a jack in the box, right? So I go to my boss and I tell my boss, hey, you know what? I need a promotion this year. And the boss says, Shri, yeah, I know you're ready, but not this year. I've decided to give it to, I don't know, Isabella or somebody or maybe to Philip or somebody. And then the boss is able to say, you know what? I know, you know, for no, you know, for proper reasons, Philip deserves that promotion, right? Typically, Indian women, we come out, well, I, I, it's nothing to do with Indian women. It's actually man versus woman, right? So a man I see would come out and say, hey, Philip, did, uh, you know, did the boss say yes or no? Philip would usually go, this year he said no, but he said, if I finish ABC next year, there's a good chance, oh, tough luck, but I'm gonna try next year. Life goes on. A woman, oh my God, I finished that work and I tried so hard. I don't like him, you know, I think he's a sexist. I really think he might be a sexist, right? We have, you know, we take it much, much more personally than what it deserves. A jack in the boxes, go back next month and say, hey, remember what you said? Next year, I'm getting it, right? You already forgot, next year is my turn. Go back in March and tell him, I'm waiting for next Jan, that's my turn. So by the time it's next Jan, you've told him 12 times. At least once he's going to remember, oh, this one's such a, yeah, such, this one's waiting for it. I better see whether this one deserves it or not, right? Don't take it personally. Not every no needs to be taken personally. Right? Use your sense of humor, right? Make a joke and say, boss, you never give me a raise, do you? No, well, give me a raise, right? Make a joke, use humor. That's the power of being a woman. That's a power for everybody, but more so for women. We come across, we do so well, you know, when we use humor as our weapon, right? We do so well when we acknowledge that we are emotional beings. Nothing to be compared with men as individuals, 
women are emotional beings. There is nothing wrong with that, right? Um, so when we acknowledge it, when we be ourselves and we tackle it, absolutely, we do so well, right? So with that, I wish all the women the very, very best. And I look forward to listening to Ms. Kareem. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, ma'am. Indeed, there are biases all around the women and being tagged as Mahila with the expectation to do all the gender stereotype works, it's all relatable. Let's move to the next segment. Whenever I think of women in sports, be it hockey, cricket, boxing, or even cycling for that matter, it gives a picture of free and untrammeled womanhood. We are proud to have with us Ms. Saba Anjum, ma'am, who is the former member of Indian women's hockey team. She was the youngest of all participants in the hockey competition at 2002 Commonwealth Games. She played for India in under 18 AHF Cup in 2000. And as a right wing forward, she has represented India in many international tournaments like Asian Games of October, Asian Cup February, Commonwealth, etc. She was awarded Padma Shri and Arjun Award. I am going to ask you that you have to do this. Saba, ma'am. Hello. Hanji, ma'am. Hello. Yes, ma'am. I mean, the journey was very long, but we couldn't tell much more. We can say that when we started playing, we struggled a lot. Because when we start playing, we have to start playing with each small thing. We have to start playing with each small thing. So, we have to suffer with that thing that मतलब जब खेलना शुरू किया तो उससे भी जरूरतें पूरी होने नहीं होती थी तब भी हमने खेलना शुरू किया बस खेलते गए जो भी चीज हमें मिलता था उसको लेके बस खेलते गए खेलते गए और हर स्टेप में हमें हर दिन में एक नया नया सबक नया चीज नए लोग हर चीज मुझे हम लोगों को दिखने लगे जब एक जगह स्कूल से जब हम खेलने लगे जब नेशनल खेलने लगे जब अपने स्टेट खेलने लगे नेशनल खेलने लगे थोड़ा आगे बढ़े तो फिर समझ आया कि खेल बेन क्या होता है किसलिए हम कंपटीशन करते हैं क्योंकि हमको खेल के समय बहुत कंपटीशन का जो मायने रहता है वो पता चलता है तो हेलो हाँ हेलो हम आपके पास आ रही है आ रही है ना तो जैसे जैसे मैंने स्टेट बाइज जब खेलने शुरू करी तो हम लोग का स्टेट हुआ उस टाइम तो एमपी था कंपटीशन भी बहुत थे इतनी जरूरतें नहीं होती थी अब तो इस टाइम बहुत सारे जरूरतें अब पूरे होने लग गए प्लेयरों के तो जब मैंने नेशनल खेला एमपी के समय फिर हमारा ग्रीस मकालिंग कैंप लगा नेशनल हुआ हम लोग क्या बोलते हैं नेहरू इंडिया कैंप जब सिलेक्शन हुआ नेहरू इंडिया कैंप में जब गए तो इंडिया टीम में सिलेक्शन हुआ जब इंडिया टीम में जब सिलेक्शन हुआ तो वहां जाके देखे की खेल क्या होता है खेल के लिए हमें क्या करना पड़ता है क्योंकि हमने शुरू से टफ देखा नहीं था टफ यहाँ था ही नहीं तो टफ वहां जब हमने जाके देखा कि टफ में खेलना होता है खेल टफ में खेलने के लिए हमें क्या चीज की जरूरत पड़ती है तो बस इसी तरह से दौर शुरू हुआ और जब इंडिया टीम में सिलेक्शन होने के बाद जब हमने जब मैंने खेला तो उस टाइम कॉम्पिटिशन बढ़ा और चाह बढ़ने लग गई हर चीज फाइट करने लग गए हम लोग स्टेप बाय स्टेप टूर्नामेंट खेलने लग गए और बस और मैं इतने मतलब बहुत एकदम रिच फैमिली से थी नहीं पुअर फैमिली से थी हमारी कुछ जरूरतें होती थी वो भी पूरा नहीं होते थे तो जब इंडिया टीम में सिलेक्शन हुआ वहाँ काफी मेहनत करना पड़ा काफी हार्ड वर्क करने लगा लेकिन बहुत शॉर्टली समय में मुझे इंडिया टीम सीनियर इंडिया टीम में सिलेक्शन हो गया और लकली मुझे अंडर सिक्सटीन में जॉब मिल गया रेलवे में क्योंकि जब हम कॉमनवेल्थ खेल के आए एशियन जब कॉमनवेल्थ खेल के आए उस टाइम हमारा गोल्ड मेडल आया हुआ था तो नीतीश कुमार हमारे रेल मंत्री थे तो उन्होंने पूछा कि किसके पास जॉब नहीं क्योंकि उन्होंने पूरी टीम को पैसा दिया और मुझे पैसा नहीं दिया बोले एक लड़की कौन है तो मुझे बुलाए पूछे कि तुम तुमको क्या चाहिए मैंने कहा सर मुझे नौकरी दे दीजिए बोले कहाँ करना चाहती हो तो मैंने कहा बॉम्बे में तो बोले ठीक है तो उन सबको पैसे दिए मुझे अंडर अंडर सिक्सटीन में मुझे सोलह साल की जस्ट हुई हुई थी मैं मुझे रेलवे में नौकरी मिल गई मतलब हम लोग एक हॉकी ऐसा खेल है जो मतलब गरीबों का खेल है उसको मतलब हर कोई नहीं खेल सकता क्योंकि बहुत टेक्निक खेल है बहुत फिटनेस खेल है बहुत दिमाग वाला स्पोर्ट्स तो सब बहुत मेहनत करने वाला रहता है लेकिन हॉकी बहुत टेक्निक खेल होता है तो बस बस वहाँ अब बॉम्बे में मैंने सिलेक्शन हुआ बॉम्बे में मैंने रेलवे ज्वाइन किया और हम जो लड़कियां थी इंडिया टीम की कम से कम 10 से 12 लड़कियां हम पूरे वेस्टर्न रेलवे मुंबई के थी तो वहां पर मुझे हर चीज का ग्राउंड का सपोर्ट मिला साथ का सपोर्ट मिला और वो जो दौर शुरू हुआ 2000 से लेके 2012 तक का 
तो बस मैंने फिर वापस नहीं देखा और अपने साथियों के साथ अपने सीनियर प्लेयरों के साथ मैंने देखा कि वो हमेशा बोलते थे कि हमने इतने साल खेला इंडिया टीम के लिए हमने ये किया वो किया क्योंकि हम जब खेलते हैं तो हमारा हमारा एम होता है अवार्ड पाना नहीं होता है हमारा एम होता है कि हम लोग हिंदुस्तान की कप्तानी करें क्योंकि कप्तानी करने के लिए बहुत कंपटीशन करना पड़ता है बहुत मेहनत करना पड़ता है अपने आप को हर टूर्नामेंट के लिए फिट रखना पड़ता है अपने आप को हर टूर्नामेंट में प्लेइंग खेलने के लिए रखना पड़ता है तो इसलिए हम हम हमारा एम हो जाता है कि हमको कैप्टनशिप करना और कैप्टनशिप करने के लिए आपको डेढ़ सौ दो डेढ़ सौ पौने दो सौ मैच खेलना पड़ता है तब जाके आपको कैप्टनशिप मिलती है तो वो जो सफर था कैप्टनशिप पाना और फिर कैप्टनशिप पाने के बाद फिर हमें जो अवार्ड से मिलते हैं तो कैप्टनशिप पाने में जो अर्जुन अवार्ड होता है वो एक रहता है प्लेयरों को कि अर्जुन अवार्ड लेना है तो एक वो अवार्ड हो जाता है लेकिन वो जगह पर जाने की जो स्थिति जो सफर था वो इतना मुश्किल था कि हम बयान नहीं कर सकते क्योंकि उस चीज को अगर हम बोलने शुरू करेंगे तो हम मतलब बहुत दुख भी होता है और बहुत खुशी भी होती है क्योंकि हम लोगों ने इतना हार्ड वर्क अपना आ, मतलब करके निकल गए हैं क्योंकि हमारे घर वाले वो चीज जो स्थिति हमने अपने घर वालों को देखी है और आज हम यहाँ पर है और ऐसा नहीं कह सकते कि हम लोग को मतलब हमने जो खेल शुरू किया था कि बोलते हैं कि क्रिकेट को ये मिलता है वो मिलता है सब अपने अपने जगह में खेलते हैं लेकिन आज हमने हॉकी खेला और मैंने कभी ये नहीं सोचा था कि मुझे हॉकी आज यहाँ तक ले आएगी क्योंकि आज हॉकी की वजह से ही मैं यहाँ पर हूँ मेरे खेल की वजह से यहाँ पर हूँ आज मेरे खेल ने मुझे सब कुछ दिया तो बस ये मैं ये कहना चाहूंगी कि मतलब ऐसा हर पेरेंट्स को अपने बच्चों को खिलाना चाहिए जरूर अगर वो नहीं खेल सकता तो जिस चीज में वो जाना चाहता होगा उस चीज में जाए वो लेकिन ऐसा हम नहीं बोल सकते कि किसी के पास कुछ होना नहीं होता हर कोई हर इंसान के पास कुछ ना कुछ रहता है तो वो चीज को उसके उसको बाहर निकलाए उसको बाहर निकाल के कोशिश करे क्योंकि आज हम यहाँ पहुंचे हैं हमको इतना अचीवमेंट के बाद सरकार हम हम हर खिलाड़ियों को हर खिलाड़ियों को जो ओलंपिक खेल के आता है ओलंपिक में मेडल लाता है या कोई भी टूर्नामेंट बड़े टूर्नामेंट में मेडल लेके आता है तो उनको पूरा सम्मान मिलता है सम्मान के साथ साथ हर एक खिलाड़ियों को एक बैक सपोर्ट की जरूरत होती है क्योंकि खिलाड़ी दस साल पंद्रह साल खेलता है बीस साल खेलता है उसके बाद एक सपोर्ट की जरूरत पड़ती है नौकरी की तो आज अब सपोज मैं थी मुझे भी मेरी सरकार ने मुझे नौकरी दिया डीएसपी का पोस्ट दिया मेरे अचीवमेंट के हिसाब से मेरे और साथी लोग हैं उनको भी दिया अभी करेंटली जो ओलंपिक खेल के आए थे हमारे मैन वुमेन उन लोगों को भी क्लास वन ऑफिसर की नौकरी दिया क्योंकि हमारा जो सफर होता है वो बहुत हार्ड होता है क्योंकि इस बीच में इतनी हमें बड़ी बड़ी इंजुरिया भी होती है जो हमारे घर वालों को पता नहीं होती है कि इन्हें क्या हुआ है इनको क्या है क्योंकि जब हम जब हमारे नी क्योंकि ज्यादातर हम लोग के नी टूट जाते हैं जैसे मेरे दोनों घुटने में एसीएल ऑपरेशन है उसके बाद मैंने 10 साल इंडिया टीम में खेला मतलब बोलने में तो लगता है कि हम लोग का एसीएल ऑपरेशन हो गया और हमने 10 साल खेला लेकिन वो जो 10 साल का बीच का जो सफर होता है उसमें अपने पैर को मेंटेन करना उसके बाद कैम्प में अपने आप को फिटनेस रखना उसके बाद टीम में जाके खेलना क्योंकि हमारा हर दो महीना तीन महीने के बाद एक एक बड़े बड़े टूर्नामेंट्स होते थे कॉमनवेल्थ आ रहा है एशियन गेम्स आ रहा है एशिया कैप आ रहा है वर्ल्ड कप आ रहा है फिर एशियन चैंपियनशिप आ रहा है एशियन चैलेंज आ रहा है मतलब आपको हर टूर्नामेंट के लिए आपको डेढ़ महीना कैंप लगाना है हर कैंप में आपको फिटनेस रखना है हर कैंप में आप हर टूर्नामेंट को आपको प्रूफ करना है तो इतनी सारी हार्ड वर्किंग हो जाती है कि हम लोग को और कुछ समझ नहीं आता है सिर्फ सिर्फ ये लगता था कि सिर्फ खेले और हमने जब तक खेला तब तक कुछ और जाना ही नहीं सिर्फ एक ही जाना था कि भाई हमको कैम में जाना है और हिंदुस्तान के लिए खेलना है बस क्योंकि हमारे जो कोच थे अभी उनकी डेथ हो गई है कौशिक सर के कौशिक सर थे द्रोणाचार्य अवार्डी अर्जुन अवार्डी थे तो ओलंपियन गोल्ड मेडलिस्ट थे हमारे सर तो उन्होंने हमेशा हम लोग को इतना मोटिवेट करते थे और वो है जो हमें आज उनकी वजह से हम यहाँ पर है साथ में और मेरे दो तीन सर थे जो हम लोग को मतलब अंडर एटीन अंडर ट्वेंटी वन उसके बाद जो रहा है तो वो हमेशा हम लोग को मोटिवेट करते थे कि आपके ऊपर सरकार इतनी मेहनत कर रही है सरकार आपको इतना इन्वेस्ट कर रही है पूरी हिंदुस्तान करोड़ों की जनता आपको देखती है तो आप मतलब उन करोड़ों में से तुम सोलह हो उन करोड़ों में से तुम ये हो तुम उन करोड़ों में से वो हो मतलब हर चीज का हम लोग को एहसास दिया जाता था कि आप यहाँ पर खाने घूमने नहीं आए आप जिस चीज के लिए आप डेढ़ महीना मेहनत करे हैं आप उसके लिए यहाँ पर आए वो जो डेढ़ महीने का है आपको एक हफ्ते में आपको वो करना है कि आपको खेल के दिखाना है ये एक हफ्ते के टूर्नामेंट में 
तो ये चीज हम पूर्व करते थे और रही बात मेरी जर्नी की तो जो शुरुआती दौर था मैं बहुत पुअर फैमिली से थी मेरा अब्बा अजान देते थे मैं बहुत कस्बे छोटे से कस्बे से खेलती थी जो मोहल्ला था तो वहां से मतलब हम बहुत सारे लोग जाते थे खेलने के लिए तो उनको देख के ही मैंने जाने शुरू किया तो जब उनको शुरू किया तो वहाँ एक ग्रीष्मकालीन कैंप था तो उसमें हम लोग को कैंप में दौड़ होता था तो मैंने दौड़ा तो मुझे किस्टिक मिली मैंने कहा अरे वाह दौड़ में दौड़ने से किस्टिक मिल जाती है तो वो चीज वो चीज को फिर मैंने आगे बढ़ाया लेकिन हॉकी को मैंने ये नहीं सोचा था कि मुझे मिलेगा लेकिन जैसे जैसे मैंने हॉकी खेलना आगे बढ़ते गया मुझे अच्छा लगने लगा लेकिन उसमें एक था कि मेरे अब्बा मौसम थे वो हमेशा बोलते थे कि ये बड़ी होएगी तो मैं इसको छुड़ा दूंगा ये बड़ी होएगी तो छुड़ा दूंगा लेकिन ऐसा दौर आया कि जब मैं थोड़ी बड़ी हुई जब थोड़ा ठीक रही तो उस टाइम मुझे नौकरी ही मिल गई 16 साल में नौकरी ही मिल गई तो मेरे अब्बा बोले कि अब इसको रहने दो अब खेलने दो करके इसको अब जब तक ये खेलना चाहती है खेलने दो तो बस यही है कि और आज मैं महिला भी हूँ और लोगों की इंस्पायर भी हूँ कि मतलब लोग मुझे जानते हैं इंस्पायर करते हैं तो उस वो देख के मुझे बहुत अच्छा लगता है और हम लोग को हर जगह सम्मान किया जाता है क्योंकि हम लोग जब एक प्लेयर जब खेलता है वो बात के लिए यही सोचता है कि बाद में उसको जो सम्मान मिले और वो सम्मान हम लोग को मिलता है आज के दिन जैसे महिला सम्मान महिला सम्मान दिवस के दिन आज जो दिन भर हम बिजी रहते हैं वो हमने जो मेहनत किया है वो चीज आज हमको मिल रही है लोग हमें बुलाते हैं जाते हैं तो बहुत अच्छा लगता है लेकिन हमें हमेशा एक वो लगता है कि दुनिया में अगर हम आए हैं तो कुछ चीज करें बोलते हैं तो उस चीज की खुशी होती है कि हमने इस एक छोटे से घर में गरीब घर में पैदा हुए लेकिन हिंदुस्तान के लिए हमने अपने आप को बहुत कुछ दिया और आज बहुत खुशी होती है कि हमें जब बुलाया जाता है और ऐसा नहीं की मुझे कहीं बुलाते खेल वेल के लिए या इंडिया टीम के लिए इंडिया स्टेट के लिए तो मैं नहीं जाती मैं हर जगह जाती हूँ क्योंकि आज हम अपने खेल की वजह से यहाँ पर है तो मैं बस यही कहना चाहूंगी कि एक खिलाड़ी का जो सफर होता है वो इतना आसान नहीं होता क्योंकि एक हम अपने जिंदगी का 18 से 20 साल एक अपनी जिंदगी का हम दे देते हैं खेल, खेलते समय तो बाद में मतलब ऐसा लगता है कि हमने इतना लंबा सफर निकाल दिया और आज हमको ऐसा लगता है कि मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि मैंने इतना लंबा सफर निकाल दिया वो तो कितना दिन हमें दिन का भी पता नहीं चलता था जब हम लोग खेलते थे तो दिन महीना क्या टाइम क्या समय बस यही पता रहता था कि सुबह उठना है और सुबह जाना है ये हमारा शेड्यूल होता था हर वीकली शेड्यूल रहता था उसको कम्प्लीट करते रहते थे तो ये मेरा सफर था और आज मैं ये आपके सामने हूँ और बस बस बहुत सारी बातें हैं जो इसमें तो नहीं कह सकते लेकिन शॉर्टली मैं एक बता दी हूँ कि मतलब हमारा सफर बहुत लंबा था बहुत हार्ड वर्किंग था इस जगह में पहुंचने के लिए बहुत मेहनत करनी पड़ी और मैं बता नहीं सकती कि हम लोग कितना मेहनत करते हैं क्योंकि इंडिया टीम में पहुंचना इंडिया टीम में कोर ग्रुप में आना फिर टीम में आना फिर प्लेइंग में खेलना फिर प्लेइंग में आपको प्रूफ करना मतलब इतना मेहनत करना पड़ता है कि आ, सफर बहुत हार्ड रहता है जो हमारे घर वालों को बिल्कुल भी नहीं पता रहता है कि हमारा बच्चा वहाँ कितना मेहनत कर रहा है उसको क्या जरूरत रहती है क्योंकि हमने इंडिया टीम में फटे जूते भी पहन के खेले पुराने कपड़े पहन के भी खेले हमको खेलना था क्योंकि हम जब खेलते थे तो हमको चीजें की जरूरत नहीं पता चलती थी कि हमको क्या चीज चाहिए हमको ये रहता था कि बस सिलेक्शन होना है और हमको खेलना है बस खेलना है तो वो चीज वो जुनून था वो खेल था और जो ये अवार्ड अवार्ड है तो ये अवार्ड के बारे में हम तो कभी सोचते नहीं थे कि हमको अर्जुन अवार्ड चाहिए या पद्मश्री अवार्ड चाहिए ये सब अवार्ड के लिए हमने खेलते समय कभी नहीं सोचा कि हमको अवार्ड चाहिए लेकिन हमने ये ये मेरा एम था कि मैं हिंदुस्तान की कप्तानी करूँ और कम से कम 10 से 12 साल में इंडिया टीम में खेलूं वो चीज मेरा सफर हुआ और बाद में मुझे हर चीज मिला सम्मान के साथ धन्यवाद मैम हिंदुस्तान को आप एक गर्व है और आप हमारे लिए एक प्रेरणा का स्रोत हैं आपकी जैसी बहुमूल्य प्रतिभा के धनी दो और गरिमावाई व्यक्ति हमारे साथ जुड़ी हुई है यहाँ पे कौमुरी गौरा मैम जो कि ह्यूमन कॉन्वर्सेशन की फाउंडर और को फाउंडर ऑफ इंक्लूसिव लीडर्स हैं और प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर विद्या राघवन मैम जो कि टेक्सास यूनिवर्सिटी यूएस में लॉ की प्रोफेसर हैं आप सभी का धन्यवाद विद दिस वी रीच द लास्ट पार्ट ऑफ इंटरनेशनल कोलोकियम मे आई नाउ रिक्वेस्ट मिस अनीता सिंह मैम असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर एच एन एलियो टू डिलीवर द वोट ऑफ थैंक्स ओ टू यू मैम थैंक यू सो मच करिमा Uh, good evening, everyone, and it has been such an honor to be a part of this wonderful event. Let me begin my formal vote of thanks by thanking Ms. Komiti Goda, ma'am, 
ma'am, your guidance and journey has been an inspiration to many. And today you have inspired us to speak up against the dichotomy in gender perceptions, the deep rooted stereotypes, leading to this invisible simmering microaggressions we face on a regular basis. Thank you, ma'am. On behalf of HNLU, I would also like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed guest, Professor Sri Vidya Raghavan, Professor of Law, School of Law at Texas A&M University. Ma'am, your words resonated with us. And while gender bias is inevitable, and quite often it's a two-way street, but we need to learn and constantly endeavor to grow out of it. Towards this end, we need to define our spaces, our own path, and fix our own ceilings. Thank you, ma'am. I would also like to thank Ms. Sava Anjo, whose inspirational journey has motivated many young girls and youth coming from an underprivileged background. I would also like to thank our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Sir, Professor Dr. V.C. Vivekanandan for his support and encouragement to this program. I would like to thank Professor Dr. Uday Shankar, Registrar of HNLU, for his unwavering encouragement to all our endeavors, including this program. My sincere gratitude to Professor Dr. Yogendra Shivastav, Dean, Outreach and External Affairs, for his constant guidance and his pillar-like support to us. I would also like to thank our faculty for gracing today's occasion and for being a part of this celebration. I would like to thank our, thank our staff members for lending us the necessary logistical support to conduct this program. And lastly, I would like to thank our students and participants who participated in huge numbers and made this event a grand success. I thank you all for being present and helping and being present here today. Thank you one and all.